1 Corinthians chapter 6. We covered a little more than half of the chapter in our last two studies, <clears throat> and we will cover the rest of the chapter this morning. We left off on verse 12 last week, if you were here with us, and so um, we'll begin in reading in verse 13, and that will take us to the end of the chapter, and then we'll come back and we'll We'll check out each verse. So verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Foods for the stomach and stomach for the foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God will raise up the Lord. And God both raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Holy Father, we thank you and praise you for this portion of scripture. I want to be able to do it some justice, Lord, as I share it with my brothers and sisters, Lord. I know the things that you have spoken to me about and the things, Lord, that are on my heart to be able to share. And Father, once again, I pray that you would give my brothers and sisters ears to hear what your word says. And just help us, Lord. And just desiring to do what your word tells us. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Foods for the stomach and stomach for the foods. <laughs> I think I shared this with you last week. Again, sometimes I'm teaching, I'm going, and, and especially doing two studies, you know, sometimes, you know, during the week. It's like, was that on Thursday night? Was that on Sunday morning? Did I share that? And doing two services, did I share it second service or first service? So sometimes I can get a little off base, but I think I, I may have uh, shared it with you. But, but verse 12 of the previous verse that we covered last week, um, where, where it says in verse 12, all things are lawful for me. It, it, was, it was a saying, a slogan, a motto, a mantra, if you will, that was among the, the Corinthians. Again, people have certain mottos, certain mantras that they say, and that was apparently one of them. Well, all things are lawful for me, you know? It's like, oh, okay, yeah. <clears throat> and that those activities that, that, or sins that Paul shared in verses 9 and 10 that we looked at last week, most of the Corinthians would say, well, all things are lawful for us in this society. None of those things we could get busted for. <laughs> they were all lawful. They were adults for the most part, <laughs> some of them. But again, that, that was a, a saying of theirs, and it was no big deal. All things are lawful. But Paul begged to differ. But he begged to differ for those who were called the righteous, for those who were now called Christian, those who, who had this new creation in them, <clears throat> that even though all things are lawful, not all things were helpful. <laughs> not all things would give you the freedom. If anything, there were some things that were lawful <clears throat> that would bring you back into the bondage or the power of those things that you had once been freed from. Because I don't know about you, but again, as adults, most of us are. 
if not all of us, we're adults. And a lot of things are lawful for us. We can do anything. And, and there are people, it's like, well, you can't, you can't. It's like, no, we can if we want to. But not all things are helpful. Not all things are, are, are good for me. I know the things that God has delivered me from, and even though it's lawful and I can go partake and be a part of, I don't want to be brought back under the bondage of those things that God has set me free from. And they are bondage. I think people is like, oh no, I could quit anytime, or I don't have to do it. It's like, really? I dare you. Because again, some people is like, ah, kind of like it. It's like, well, then just say it. <laughs> But, but again, you know, even though all things are lawful for us in, in a lot of ways, not all things are helpful. And, 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 and you need to be careful that even though you can, it's up to you, some of those things will bring you into bondage. <clears throat> and, and, and it doesn't end well, oftentimes. And, and so apparently the phrase, foods for the stomach and stomach for the foods was just another saying, another slogan, another motto, another mantra, if you will, for them. And, and loosely translated was, hey, if I have urges, needs, and desires, I'm going to fill them. Because again, hey, you got, you got to meet those needs. And you see, all those activities and or sins that Paul had just mentioned, they were all appetites. They're all appetites. That the Corinthians, they had no problem in indulging in. It wasn't a big deal for them. As long as they satisfied those urges, those needs, those desires that one might have. Of course you would do it. Now, I, I, it's interesting because last week as I was sharing all these things, I divided those 10 activities or those 10 sins into two different areas. And I shared with you how, how easy it is for us to look at the first ten, five and go, oh my gosh, how disgusting. And then we look at the second five and it's like, eh, there's just flaws that people have. And yet all of those 10, regardless of the first or second, five, they are all appetites in one form or another. Again, you, you can look at the sexual part of it. It's like, Jesse, you, how am I going to walk over here, man? <laughs> You're cramping my style somewhat, but that's fine. I will work around it. Where was I? Man, I've lost my train of thought. But be that as it may, because again, even, again, we look at the first five and it's like, man, yes, those are appetites and they're gross appetites, but, but so is thievery. It's an appetite. You can get used to stealing stuff and, and covetousness, man, that's, that's a, a, an in, inward appetite. And, and again, on and on, drunkenness, revelry, extortions, you know, all of those are appetites nonetheless. And so either one of those slogans that were common in the Corinthian society were used to justify immorality. Because we look at, at, at the sexual sins, the sensual sins, and say, well, that's immorality, but so is stealing. That's immoral. <laughs> I don't know about you. I mean, I, again, I kind of shared with you, I was a little thief. I wasn't a big thief. But I hate people stealing from me. <laughs> but when they have, it's like, hey, now I know how it feels. Be that as it may. But they use them to, to justify their immoralities. Which is fine. Which is fine if, if you fall under the unrighteous section. Under the ungodly or the not saved. That is normal for them. So again, it's, it's like for them, those who did not know Christ or had put on Christ... Sexual immorality, what is that? Any kind of immorality. And, and it's interesting because there's people that don't want to claim morality in our society, right? And I think most of the time people that, that call themselves atheists and even agnostic in, in, in that frame of mind, 
you know, it, it's only because they don't want to, they, they, want to, they want to do their own thing. And it's funny, when I've talked to people that claim those things, and, and I throw some absurdity out, and they say, well, that's not right. It's like, why are you pushing your morality on me then? Because you have some morals. So you're not quite an atheist. <laughs> You know, because, um, uh, again, these people, it didn't bother them that they did those kinds of things. But it seems like some of the Corinthian believers, they sought to continue to adhere to those slogans. Those slogans that satisfied their flesh, not so much their spirit. In other words... None of that was good for them anymore. Why? Because it just didn't fit them anymore. Not, a, not as a Christian. Not as a believer. They had been freed from many of those things, and so it didn't fit them anymore. It didn't look good on them because they portrayed Christ. And, and if you're portraying Christ and you're still doing and, and adhering to those types of slogans that, that all things are lawful, and if I have desires, I, I meet my, my desires, you know? It's like it just, just doesn't fit you anymore. And so the, the Corinthians, they, they reasoned, the non-Christian, the, the, the non-Christian Corinthians, they reasoned that food was, was pleasurable and necessary. And when their stomachs indicated this type of hunger, then food would suffice. They would take in food to satisfy that kind of hunger. But they also argued that sex was, was both pleasurable and necessary as well. And, and so it only stood to reason that when their bodies signaled sexual desire, then the only way to really feel that desire was to go practice sex, sexual immorality, to, to satisfy that desire, that urge that one had. And, and so they treated sex as an appetite to be, as an appetite to be satisfied, and not so much as a gift to be cherished and, and, and used carefully and even respectfully within the bonds of marriage. They didn't care. Sensuality to sex is what gluttony is to eating. And both are sinful. And I know that we don't often talk about gluttony, but gluttony is a sin. And so both the, the, the sensual part, the, the sensual, sensuality of sex and gluttony and eating, they, they, they both bring about terrible and destructive consequences in many ways. Oh, it might not be quick, but eventually it kind of ruins you both ways. And so just because we have certain normal desires that I believe God has created within us. Both the hunger and the drives that we have that could be sensual and or sexual. That doesn't mean that we have to give in to them all the time. To always satisfy those needs. I think as believers, we need to understand that God has given us the fruit of the Spirit. And, 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 and again, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and the byproduct of that love is, is joy, peace. You know the ones. You know the, the last one, self-control. <laughs> I should have wrote it down. <laughs> but we have the fruit of the Spirit to be able to tame those desires, to be able to not go for them. And I know what people, again, we say is like, well, the flesh is so weak. But we forget that first part of that verse where it says, but the Spirit is willing. The Spirit is always willing. The Spirit is always not willing. 
Never not willing. I know it's a double negative. Uh, my wife goes, why do you do that? It's like, I don't know, because that's the way my brain works. But the Spirit is always willing to help us tame those desires and those appetites that even though they're God-given in so many ways, we can do them to the excess. And when we do them to the excess, it ends up destroying and hurting. Because sex outside of marriage is destructive. Well, while sex in marriage can be creative and beautiful. It tells us that in, in, in Proverbs chapter 5, at the, the last portion, that we should be ravaged with our, the wife of our youth. And all of that. And so, so within marriage, there, there is this, this beauty that God has created. I mean, there, there might be excitement and, and enjoyment <laughs> in sexual experiences outside of marriage. But they're not enrich, enriching. They don't enrich your marriage or your life. Hebrews 13.4 says marriage is honorable among all. Among all? Even the unbeliever? Yeah. Marriage is good. In any society, marriage is good. Marriage is honorable among all. And it says, and the bed is undefiled. In other words, in that bond, there's nothing defiled or dirty about it. But he says, continuing in that verse... But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. However, he does that. And I think oftentimes the judgment that comes with that is the guilt and the shame that people carry for the rest of their lives. And there's people that I've counseled with that are now happily married, but they can't f- seem to forget their past because they've never really repented of some of those things. Or they've gone out on their marriage and there is shame that is associated with it and that judgment they are carrying oftentimes are people that are hooked on, on, on pornography. That, that man, oh man, it's like there's just this, it, it's not pure, you know? And people feel dirty and shamed and, and there's a sense of trying to hide all of that. And I think that's part of the, the, the shame that, and, and the judgment that God brings upon people because they're so weighed down. And God doesn't want us to be walking in shame. As one commentator put it, sex outside of marriage is like a man robbing a bank. He gets something, but it's not his, and he will one day pay for it. Sex with, within marriage can be like a person putting money into a bank. There is safety, security, and he will collect dividends. <clears throat> Sex within marriage can build a relationship that brings joy in the future. But sex apart from marriage has a way of weakening further relationships. And man, oh man, isn't that so true? The people that are weighed down because of their lifestyle, because of what they are, are, are allowing in their lives and trying to suppress certain things so that nobody finds you out. <clears throat> and it's, it's those kinds of things that, again, they, 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 it brings about this a, a, a lot of depression, a lot of shame, a lot of hiding, a lot of ugliness in people's lives and you wonder why some people end up killing themselves because of the guilt and the shame and satan just going bam bam but it's not just satan it's your own flesh it's the holy spirit convicting you because the holy spirit even convicts ungodly people because that's what he does and, and there's people that carry all of this guilt and shame with them because they're going, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So you can see this whole thing about food for the stomach. It's not really talking about foods, per se. It's talking about indulgences and pleasures 
and that to the excess. But it says, but God will destroy both it and them. The Apostle Paul argues that, that these desires, these indulgences, these pleasures, they're only temporal. They're short-lived. And they are passing away. Because God will not recognize them as eternal or lasting. They are fleshly. Now the body, it says here, now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And the use of the word body here in our text is not just the physical aspect of the body frame, the, the, the flesh, if you will. It, it refers to something even bigger or deeper, which means the body as a whole, which is composed of the flesh and the spirit. The soul, if you will. There's something deeper than just the physical. And that, that's the word body here. It's not just fleshly things. It's deeper than that. Which causes Paul to kind of draw this sharp line between the stomach and the body, the flesh and the spirit, the physical and the emotional or spiritual part that, that, that comes within this whole frame of who we are as, as a person. It, it, it speaks of our personality. It's, and, and so it goes deeper. And I love the fact that, again, he's writing about this, but he's not writing to the people outside the world or outside in the world. He's writing to believers here. He's reminding us of what we have done when we've come to Christ. And he says that the body is not for sexual immorality. Not within, the, not within Christ, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. <laughs> As I was looking at this, it's almost like Paul is wanting to start a new slogan that maybe will catch on. <laughs> Just kidding. Instead of food for the stomach, but no, no. The Lord for, for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Anyways. But in reality, he is telling the Corinthian Christian that now that they are a new creation in Christ, the slogans of the world they just don't fit. You don't need to, to adhere yourself to them any longer. That was the old you. They, 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 we, we covered this last week, and I think, and Pastor Daniel touched on it a few weeks ago, but they were all dead to Christ at one point. But now they have been made, made alive in Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> And it wasn't just about their flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh. They were now in a new union, in a new relationship, and it was reciprocal. It was mutual. When, when, when we come to Christ, as we draw near to Him, He draws near to us, and then we become a part of who He is, and He becomes our life. And so... They had a new relationship. And so they, as believers, were not to use their bodies for sexual immorality because their bodies, their, their, their whole bodies, which is made up of, of spirit, soul, and body, was now the Lord's. It, it, it's almost like in, you're, you're in this marriage relationship with Him. Because you're the bride of Christ. You, you've become one with him, if you will. And so in verse 14, he says, And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. It, the, this, this verse, verse 14, seems to take the focus off the temporal and onto the eternal. Because the desires that feed and satisfy the flesh will be done away with. 
but the eternal will last. And when he uses the phrase raised up, the first raised up in this verse, raised up, that he raised up the Lord, it speaks about the Lord's resurrection. Whereas the raise us up means arouse up or rouse up, stir up, incite. Which, which does suggest that it refers to, to things of the Lord and those things that will last for the kingdom of God. That, that we are able to do and fulfill because he's roused us, he's raised us up, he's, he's, he's put us in a different place. And, and, and we can stir up those gifts that he has given to us and walk with him and do the things that, that he desires instead of what we desire. We get to fulfill what his heart wants instead of what our heart wants. And I know that that's a battle for every one of us because we, we battle the flesh all the time. But again, you are new. You are in Christ. And as, and as God has raised him up by the power of God's power to raise him up from the dead, that power is in you. To raise you up in, 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 in such a way to, to cite, incite a, a, a different tone in your life because you're not who you used to be. Now, that's not to say that it, <clears throat> this can't also be talking about the, the final resurrection of the body that will happen at the end of time when he will raise us Raise up our, our bodies that are still here, however that works. That's beyond my, my understanding. But he will raise us up one day. Just like Jesus is in glory. He will also do the same to our lowly bodies, as it tells us in, in Philippians 3.21. He says, who will transform our lowly bodies. Think, talking about the physical body, that we may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the workings by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Again, we'll, we'll talk, talk more about the, the resurrection and the bodily resurrection when we get to chapter 15. But the crux of what Paul is, is getting at is that if Christ is pure, holy, and now in glory, and he is, then we should desire to do the same and to be the same and not defile ourselves like those who do not know God. And he is able to do that in our lives because he's given us his Holy Spirit. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome those things that would drag us back into bondage. Because he is able. And so in verse 15, he says, Do you not know that the body, that the bodies, that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them into members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her for the two he says, shall become one flesh. Here in our text this morning, <clears throat> we have the last three of the six do you not know phrases that is found in this chapter. And with the inference is that you should know <laughs> or you should have known these things. With the, that, that sarcastic overtone or undertone, of, of, oh, I thought that you guys were, I thought you guys knew all this stuff. You're so into your knowledgeable, you're being, being so knowledgeable and you're proud of what you do know. Oh, I thought you knew this. But he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? In, in, in talking and mentioning that word members, Paul is saying that because they had come to Christ and had become part of the body of Christ, they were now one with Christ. They had become part of the because there's only one body, as it tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. 
And, and the word members means a limb or part of the body. In other words, something that is attached and truly belongs to that body. And it would be virtually impossible to take a member of one body and, and, and make it a member of somebody else's body. You can't, you can't just do that. <laughs> you can't like, here, let me give you my arm, you know, put it on your body. It's like, I'd have three arms. I don't need another arm. Sometimes they're handy. You might want that. <laughs> but it would be virtually impossible to give somebody else a member of your body. And so that's what he is saying. He says, shall I take a member of, of the body of Christ and give it over to a harlot? And so the inference is, how can, can we do that if we are in Christ? How can we take a part of Christ and, and be a part of sin at the same time? Because the word harlot here is the word prostitute, but he's using it and, and alluding to it as sin. And the fact that, that we, are in, we are part of Christ and Christ would never become part of a harlot in that sense. He, he, he poses it as a question, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of, of a harlot? Certainly not. <laughs> if you were with us when we were going through the book of, of Romans, we saw that phrase, certainly not, like, I don't know, 11, 12 times. And, 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 and again, it's only, well, not again, but it's only used once here in, in 1 Corinthians. And that phrase, certainly not, as I shared with you back in the book of Romans, it can be tra translated by no means. Of course not. Not at all. That would be unthinkable. Perish that thought. God forbid. And yet, the phrase here just simply means never. As in, never, never. There's an emphasis. And I gave it one more emphasis, ever. <laughs> never, never, ever. That's what Paul is saying. That would never, ever, ever happen. That, 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 that I could take a part of Christ and go, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't gel, it doesn't go together. It would never adhere. Because Christ would never do that. And so he, he, he reminds them again in verse 16, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? Now, even though you cannot ever be a part of another body, you can certainly join another body. But that would take an act of intimacy. Intimacy. That is meant for marriage and marriage only. And if you're already married <laughs> in one respect to Christ and, 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 and joining a harlot, that would be an act of adultery or fornication. You, you, you see, many in the Corinthian society who saw no harm in any of this, they had no problem visiting the, the temple prostitutes where, where there was a thousand <laughs> male and female prostitutes at the temple of uh, Epaphras. Uh, no, Epaph Epaphrodite. No, something like that. Aphrodite. Aphrodite. That, that, that's where one, one of the main temples of Aphrodite was at. And, and they had all these prostitutes, male and female. And so they had no issue committing fornication or even adultery. And, and what was unfortunate was that some of the believers in Corinth still saw no harm in engaging in those activities. And that's why Paul is writing to them going, hmm, 
Should we be joined, being joined together? No, we shouldn't. And, and it's interesting because he takes it so, I mean, he takes it really far where, where he kind of, kind of uh, refers to the creation act back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 that we covered a few weeks ago on Thursday night. Where, where after Adam, you know, it's like, man, there's nobody for me. And God says, here, let me make you a rib. Let me take your rib and make you a, a woman here. And, and it says, and, and, and you shall leave your father and mother, even though there was no father and mother yet. In that respect, he was building this principle that you would leave and then cleave, join together with your, with your wife, and you would become one flesh. And, and he takes it to that extreme if you will, to explain the seriousness of sexual sin. You see, when a man and woman join their bodies, it's not just a physical act. It takes the entire person, the body, the, the, the personality, the, all of it. It takes all of that. It, it, it involves it because it, it, it goes beyond the physical and enters into the emotional. And I would say it, will, it, it takes you into the, the spiritual. Because believe it or not, when, when God set up this, this marriage bed, <laughs> He wanted it to go all the way to, to, to spiritual. Because, I, I, and I think I've shared it with you, that when I do weddings, I often share that, you know, well, at the end of the ceremony, these two will become one flesh. And I always tell the couple, I'm going to say that, it sounds really cute in the, mar in, in the ceremony. I said, but I'm kind of lying, because you're not going to be one until you consummate your marriage that evening. Then God sees you as one flesh, because it's in that act that God says, now they are one. And so it's not just physical, and it's, it becomes emotional. And you know that, that, again, when you've been outside their marriage or before you got married or you're committing fornication, there's an emotional attachment. That is, and, and, and it's not just the woman. It's not just the woman. The guy understands that too. And people say, oh, guys are just dogs, man. They go anywhere. It's like, I bet you most guys will, will tell you how many times they've done it. <laughs> Because there's a little number thing that, the little number clicker that you go, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was reading years ago, the late uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Some of you guys know. He had a number. In the tens of thousands, like 20,000, it's like, how did he know it was in that range? Because it was a little clicker that went on. Because it's not just a physical act, it's an emotional act. And it gets down to the spiritual and it affects us. It really does. And if you think it doesn't, it will eventually catch up with you. Because God made sex something that is pure, holy, and good in the bonds of marriage. That's why he put it that way. And you go, well, God's just a killjoy. He's like, no, he knew that it would kill you. And it would take away your joy. Because many people are walking around joyless because they think it's not a big deal. And it really, really does affect them. And so there's a much deeper experience about this whole oneness deal. And it brings about these, these deep and lasting consequences which alters people's lives. It really does. And guys, as, as much counseling as I've done, both with Christians and non-Christians, I've seen it. I, I, I've walked people through these times of going, first of all, repentance is in order. <laughs> and then asking for forgiveness, not only to the Lord, but to your spouse or to your whoever, is in order so that you're not walking around in that. And again, it affects Christians as it does non-Christians. And I was thinking about this because, again, you know, society tells us it's not a big deal. And yet, I've dealt with and I've watched and I've seen that even in non-Christian homes, adultery is kind of still a big deal. And people get divorced over those things. And, and, and again, you know, you, you, you look at these, 
these people, these prominent people that are in prominent places and they're getting divorced because their wife or their husband caught them cheating on them. It's like, I thought there was no big deal in the world. It is. It always is. It eventually gets to them. Uh, understand that Paul is not saying, affirming or holding to the position that if a man goes and joins or a woman goes and joins a prostitute, that they are now married. He's not saying that, but again, he's, 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 he's taking it to the extreme to show the gravity of, 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 of sin, of sexual and sensual sin. There's a gravity to it. There's a depth to it. Because marriage involves a commitment between a man and a woman that, 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 that they are to leave the parental home and, and be joined together like glue to one another and begin their own life and their own home. Joining with a harlot is not the same kind of commitment. <laughs> There's not that same kind of commitment. And I think oftentimes people think, well, if you just... You know, it's not love, it's lust. <laughs> I get that. But again, it goes back to just satisfying the urges and the needs and the desires just to fulfill that appetite that we have. But it takes you deeper than you really want to go. And that shame will, will devastate us and devastate us in, in powerful, powerful ways. And so this helps us understand why sex within marriage can be an enriching experience of growth within your marriage. And we'll be covering that in, in, in chapter 7 and, and the depths of that. So you can read ahead because, again, within marriage, it's based on commitment between two people. A man and a woman. And I hate the fact that I have to preface that. That, 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 that it's between a man and a woman. Because like, our society is like way out there. And it's like, well, they truly do love each other. It's like, I understand that. But it's between a man and a woman, this bonds of marriage. When they, when they pledge their love and their faithfulness to one another, you're able to build on that, that foundation because it becomes stronger and stronger in your life. And, and so marriage basically protects sex and enables, allows, and, and empowers the couple committed to each other in marriage to, to grow in our society, within the church, and even outside the church. It helps our society. But he says in verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one with him. Jesus told his disciples in the upper room on the night before he was to go to the cross that their relationship would change after that whole thing happened. Because his spirit, the Holy Spirit, would now be in them. He had been with them, but now he would be in them. And I love the fact that right before the day of Pentecost, he says, and that power will come upon you. It will overflow. And so it seems like the whole of the Trinity, as Jesus was sharing with them, would now make their home in the believer. And there would be this oneness about this relationship between, between man and, and Christ and, and God. And, and it's almost like it goes deeper than, than, earthly, than an earthly marriage. Because an earthly marriage will eventually, for the most part, be separated by death. So it's only temporal. But when we are joined to the Lord, it is forever. It is eternal. You see, our spouses that we are one with, they're only part of our life. My wife is only part of my life. She's only a part. Of, she is not my life. Your spouse is not your life, and she shouldn't, or he shouldn't be your life. Christ is my life. <laughs> He's my everything. He's not a priority. My wife is my number one priority. Because Christ 
engulfs all my priorities. So, so again, but this is temporal. She will die. I will die at one point. But nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I know that people use that phrase, oh, it's just my soulmate. Sounds so cute. Oh, my soulmate. Mm. But being one spirit with Christ... (laughs) Now that speaks of soulmate. (laughs) You are one with him because there is so much pureness and holiness associated with that relationship with with Christ that will never, ever end. But then he says, how much time do I have? Verse uh, 18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Notice with me in that first phrase that Paul did not stay say, stay and reason with sexual immorality. He, he, he did not say, hey, debate the matter over fornication. Contend or fight with the propensities in, in porneia. <laughs> Or, or, or he didn't even say, or, or even try to strengthen your virtue against sexual immorality. <laughs> no. <laughs> a man or a woman needs to flee from it. The Greek word for flee is vamus. <laughs> Can you believe that? I think I pronounced it right, which means to scram or to bolt. (laughs) Just kidding. The actual word is fugo. Fugo. (laughs) And it means run away, literally or figuratively, by implication to shun, by analogy to vanish, escape. This is what you would call the, the, the Joseph method. If you remember in Genesis 20 or 39, 11 and 12, it says, and it happened at this time. Again, he's in Potiphar's house and he oversees Potiphar's house and his wife. Dang, man, she wouldn't leave this cat alone. But it says, and it happened at this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the other men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. It's probably a little bit more sensual than that. <laughs> lie with me. <laughs> Anyways. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. He left his garment. He fled. He f- and, and, and it's interesting because he's accused of rape after that. But he knew, he, he, I'll, do the, I'll do the time. I didn't do anything to her because he fled. Barnes Notes puts it this way. I love this. It says, there are sins which a man can resist, some about which he can reason without danger of pollution. But this is a sin where a man is safe only when he flies. Free from pollution only when he refuses to entertain a thought of it. Secure when he seeks a victory by flight and a conquest by retreat. Let a man turn away from it without reflecting on it and he is safe. Let a man think and reason and he may be ruined. Oh, it, it, it reminded me of Proverbs 7, verse, uh, verse 24 to 27. It, it says, now therefore, talking about the seductress, right? The woman, <laughs> you know. It says, it, he's saying, therefore, now therefore, listen to, to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside 
to her ways. Do not stray into her path, for she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way of hell, descending to the chambers of death. Oh, warning, warning, right? Every sin that a man commits, he says, is in, uh, uh, commits, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality. So, again, sorry, man, I get caught up in my little things here and I misread stuff. Paul, Paul warns that sexual sin is, is, is a very serious sin. Not the unpardonable sin, understand that, but it's a very most, par- most serious sin a person can commit against his body because it involves the whole of his body. Again, sex is just not physical. Coming together as male and female involves the total person, spirit, soul, and body because the sexual experience affects the totality of who we are the totality. And that's why I believe God wanted one man and one woman in marriage for life. Because he understood the devastation that happens. And again, only death should separate us. And again, we'll we'll be covering some of those things in the next chapter. But as we close up here in verses 19 and 20, he says, or do you not know? Again, here we have the sixth time that he makes this phrase again yes you should have known because i have taught you these things he says or do you not know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have from god and you are not your own for you were bought at a price therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are god's again guys it's not a bad thing (laughs) not a bad thing. And I love the fact that, that as we read this portion of Scripture, we, 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 we get the totality of the, of, of, the, of the Trinity that's involved here because God the Father created our bodies. God the Son redeemed them and made them part of His body. And it is God the Holy Spirit who indwells our bodies. And makes us the very temple of God. And so I love the fact that we are not our own. It's not a bad thing to be, not be your own. I think some people are like, oh no, I'm my own man. It's like, you're going to get yourself in trouble. I love the fact that, that when we come to Christ, He takes all that responsibility in that sense. Because He is the groom. He is the one that takes care of his wife. When you read chapter 5 of Ephesians, the women get like this much and the guy gets like that much, right? Because Christ will take all of it and all the woman has to do is submit. (laughs) I'm kidding. She has to respect her husband as well. But Christ, you know, as, as the man, he is to love and 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 give and 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 you know, you go down the list. You know, you know the thing. You know that old saying. It's not an old saying, <laughs> but it's not a bad thing that you are not your own anymore. You are Christ. You belong to Christ, and you see again. You 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 think about all of this in, in, in the marriage term because marriage emulates that relationship between Christ and His bride. I, I belong to my wife and my wife belongs to me. It's not a bad thing in that sense. And, and, and so it, it's not. And, and, and so when we think in the spiritual terms, if I belong to Christ and He belongs to me in that respect, why, why would I want to defile the temple? By using your body, our bodies, for sexual immorality. He says, you were bought with a price. Jesus Christ bought us with a price. And and, and so we see the doctrine of propitiation here, which, which means that God was satisfied with that price, with that payment, which was His blood that sufficed the Father. 
and therefore our bodies belong to him. And we are one spirit with the Lord. And we have to yield our bodies to him as living sacrifices, as we've covered back in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let me read these last two verses in the Amplified, and then we'll close up. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives with you? whom you have received as a gift from God, and you are not your own. You were bought with the price, purchased with the preciousness, and, pre and, and paid for by his own, or made his own. So then, honor God and bring glory to him in your bodies. Guys, if we begin our days acknowledging him, giving Him our lives and in our bodies, our whole being. And, 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 and then just kind of dwell on that as you move forward. I, it should make a big difference in our lives to go, Lord, help my body, the whole of me, to honor you, to worship you, because I don't know if I'll see the end of it. <laughs> I don't know if I'll see the end of this day. And so while I'm here, I want to honor and worship you with our aim to glorifying Him with all of who we are because we are not our own amen? amen jesus we thank you once again for your precious precious promises lord lord what an amazing portion of scripture lord god that again you allow us to be able to read you allow us lord god to take our time in i thank you lord god for your word i pray that lord the things that i was able to share the things that were not of you would just fall by the wayside lord but that you would truly penetrate our hearts lord Father, I understand, Lord God, because we all battle, men and women, Lord. We battle our flesh and the desires and the appetites that, Lord, they, they are given to us by you, Lord God, but, man, Lord, have we perverted them. And, Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, in allowing you, Lord God, because your spirit dwells in us, that we would just surrender all that we are to you each and every day. Lord, that you would just remind us, Lord, how much you do love us. You paid a, a huge price for us. And Lord, let us just rest in who you are. Father, I do pray for my brothers and sisters here who have been carrying around guilt and shame. And Father, it's been powerful and it's been weighing them down and it's affected, Lord God, their life, their marriage, their relationships with people and even with you, Lord. But you brought them here today, Lord. And I pray that today, there would be re repentance. Father, please, Lord. And Lord, that they would accept your forgiveness, Lord. That they would desire to be holy like you are holy. Lord, if there's anyone who's here this morning that doesn't know you, Lord, and somehow they came here this morning, Lord, or they've been here before, but have never really truly committed themselves to you, Lord, I pray that this morning you capture their heart. Lord, they are weighed down not just because of sexual immorality, Lord, because they're not righteous. And I pray that, God, you would just work that in them today and draw them to yourself. We honor you and we praise you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Let's stand as we sing this last song. If you need prayer, we'll have people up here that will definitely be praying for you and pray for you. But we love you. God bless you.